And just like that, not even two weeks following Starship's 10th flight, SpaceX is already gearing up for Flight 11. And no, we're not exaggerating. Road closures have been posted and Booster 15-2 has rolled to the pad for static fire testing in preparation for its second flight. The SpaceX steamroller is out in full force this week. I'm Max Evans for NSF, and we'll be covering all of that and much more coming up on this week's Starbase Update. Overall, the pace of work this week started off pretty slow. Part of that was due to some rough weather, but also because Monday was a holiday here in the US. You can actually see a perfect example of that right here, as there's a big thunderstorm rolling in behind pad two. Under these conditions, crews aren't really able to get much done due to the risk of lightning and high winds. In a way, I guess it worked out since the bad weather and the scheduled day off lined up almost perfectly. On Tuesday, SpaceX shifted its focus back to work on Pad 2, and we started to notice some pretty interesting signs that Pad 2 is rapidly moving towards operational readiness. One of the best examples of that came from the deluge system area, and more specifically, one of the gas generators that powers Pad 2's deluge system was up and running. For context, these generators are what pressurize the system so water can get forced through all the pipes leading out towards the pad. The Delu system here operates at very high pressures, allowing it to stand up to the incredible heat and abrasion of Super Heavy's 33 Raptor engines, and at the same time, protecting the other support hardware around the launch pad. As you can both see and hear, I just caught the tail end of that. That was loud. The test itself was pretty loud with the gas generator spinning up during the trial run. Now, Pad 2's DELU system is built quite differently than what we are familiar with on Pad 1. On Pad 1, it's basically just a plate at the bottom that water flows through upwards and out. But with Pad 2, the water comes out of this big diverter-shaped structure inside of the flame trench with the trench itself diverting that water flow outwards. It's going to be fascinating to watch the difference in exhaust plume behavior between launches on Pad 1 and launches on Pad 2, of course, once it's fully operational. And just to be clear, this doesn't mean Pad 2's DELU system is ready to go. What we saw was simply another piece of the puzzle being tested. It's likely that before the system is officially signed off and declared operational, we'll see a full test of the system at its desired flow rate and pressures. That stands as a huge milestone, showcasing everything working together as intended. But the DELU system isn't the only area of Pad 2 that's seeing progress. Overnight, we saw a new piece being lifted into place on the chopsticks. This particular component is part of the stabilizer system for said chopsticks. The purpose of these stabilizers is pretty much what the name suggests, to stabilize. Think of it like this. If you're holding a bottle of water with just two fingers on opposite sides, the bottle still has plenty of freedom to swing or wobble back and forth. But if you add two more points of contact, basically gripping it along two axes, you're locking it down securely. This is exactly what the chopstick stabilizers are designed to do. Of course, once SpaceX transitions to using Pad 2, which Elon has said that they would like to before the end of the year, they'll need these stabilizers in place. Without them, lifting the hardware with the chopsticks could turn into what would basically be the most expensive swinging church bell in human history, but without the nice musical note. On Tuesday, I was lucky enough to capture some very detailed shots of Pad 2's components, which makes this a perfect opportunity to check in on the hardware to see what's in place and what's still missing. Looking over at the chopsticks side, there's still scaffolding all over the place. SpaceX obviously still needs to finish installing both stabilizers to make sure that they're ready to operate. That said, we already know that the chopsticks themselves are functional as we have seen them both move up and down and opening and closing as they were intended. Honestly, this might be one of the most advanced parts of Pad 2 at this stage of construction. However, the tower is still missing a very critical component, the Ship Quick Disconnect Arm, or SQD. That is still under construction at the production site and will need to be installed before the pad can be considered fully operational, of course. You could make the case, though, that booster testing could still be carried out even before the arm is in place. And for all we know, that might actually be the plan. On the pad itself, don't be fooled by all the scaffolding, or scafungus, as DOS recently called it. Behind all of that, more critical elements like the Booster Quick Disconnects, or BQDs, and various other plumbing systems are being integrated. And honestly, progress is looking great. As we always like to say, the devil is in the details, and SpaceX has been hyper-focusing on those details for quite some time now. This means that the pad deck might not be far from reaching a point where we begin to see some of the scaffolding coming down, finally getting a full look at Pad 2 in all of its glory. 
And speaking of the stabilizers that we mentioned earlier, on Wednesday, SpaceX continued work on them and installed even more components. It's clear that these stabilizers are a priority at the moment, and much of the team's focus seems to be centered on making sure that they are installed as soon as possible. However, installations don't always go as planned, so SpaceX seemingly lowered that part that they were working on and placed it back on the ground. Perhaps that payment wasn't quite what SpaceX wanted, but this happens from time to time, so no need to worry. Construction also continues on the new support bunker going up next to Pad 2. As it stands, it has two separate levels right off of Highway 4. It'll be really interesting to see what its final purpose ends up being. Farther down Highway 4, the area around the new air separation unit is moving forward with additional foundation work. Specifically, we're seeing concrete being poured. This is, of course, part of the larger revamp of the launch pad area at Starbase. And it's really impressive to see how so much of that site has evolved in recent times. Over at the production site, we spotted some more crane assembly hardware being delivered. This is usually evidence that construction is at a point where a crane or cranes is needed for further work and will be going up imminently. With big projects like Gigabay steaming ahead, it's certainly warranted. Sticking with the theme of hardware movement for a moment, we also caught sight of what looked like a subcooler manifold being transported out of Starbase. Now there are a couple of possible reasons why a part like this would be leaving the site. Option number one, it could have gone to Massey's. With repairs and modifications of the site still ongoing after Ship 36's anomaly, it could have been needed there as teams prepare the site for V3 hardware. And option number two, with Starship activity really picking up at the Cape, it's possible that SpaceX has started producing parts like this in Starbase, not only for Starbase itself, but for also the Kennedy Space Center and the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Building everything in one place could be a huge resource saver before shipping components out as they're needed. We've already seen this happen before. Recall back when tower segments were moved from Hangar X here at KSC to Starbase? We sure do. Taking a quick drive away from the production site for a moment, we can see the new air separation unit that Lind is building in Brownsville. This brand new state-of-the-art facility isn't just for Starbase, it's designed to support a variety of customers in the local area. Once complete, it will be capable of producing liquid oxygen, liquid nitrogen, and argon, with some operations expected to kick off sometime in the first quarter of 2026. And honestly, judging by the current state of construction, that timeline looks pretty realistic. In case you missed it, this will actually be the second air separation unit in the Brownsville area. The first one, as you might remember, was the unit that SpaceX tinkered with for years in the production site's Sanchez lot. The way these air separation units work is by separating atmospheric air into its main components, mostly nitrogen and oxygen. Depending on the specific unit configuration, they can also produce argon and other rare inert gases depending on demand. If you're wondering why argon is included, listen to this. Argon is a commonly used gas with welding and is actually the preferred choice for certain components in Brownsville. So while this air separation unit isn't officially just for Starbase, it's very likely that for all three gases, SpaceX will have a steep demand for them. What these systems cannot produce, however, is methane. Liquid natural gas has come from other sources. While it's technically possible to synthesize methane on site using the Sabatier process, no such facility has been built at Starbase or in the surrounding area. But for now, methane is brought in the old fashioned way, by truck. We should also take a moment and mention a brand new building going up in the Starbase Village. This is going to be an apartment building with a parking garage. It will serve as an expansion for Starbase's residential area as their workforce increases in size and further demand for staff accommodation grows. Time for our McGregor Minute. This week, SpaceX only had four work days instead of the usual five since Monday was a holiday. But even with a shorter work week, they still managed to put in some impressive testing numbers. Overall, between Tuesday and Friday, SpaceX conducted 26 separate tests at the facility. A few highlights stand out, including the test of a new Falcon core stage, which fired for 78 seconds on Tuesday. Based on the available information, the expectation is that this is booster 1098. It's kind of crazy that we're nearing 100 Falcon cores built. It really shows how far SpaceX has come with its workhorse launch vehicle, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Of all tests conducted, 13 were of Raptor split between the south stand and the vertical stand. As always, the duration of these tests varied widely as some ran for around 200 seconds, while others lasted for as little as 14 seconds, allowing SpaceX to test different profiles, thrust levels, and other parameters. A majority of the engines being tested at this point are Raptor 3 engines, as the company prepares for the next generation of Starship beyond Block 2. And of course, a giant testing structure is still under construction at the site. Based on some careful counting of the scaffolding by our team, we estimate that the structure is already around 90 feet tall and it looks like it's going to get even taller. 
For a deeper look at this impressive structure, make sure to check out last week's Starbase update where we dive into all the details. If you want to see this and a lot more, be sure to check out our McGregor Live, which provides 24-7 coverage of the Raptor and Merlin engine development program right here on YouTube. Now, before we move on to Flight 11, let's take a moment to look back at Flight 10 and share a quick way that you can support us. And that's at shop.nasaspaceflight.com, where we have a great collection of shirts, mugs, and other items celebrating the recent success of Flight 10. If you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, we highly recommend it. Any and all support helps a ton and is greatly appreciated here. And the great part is, you get something pretty rad in return. Let's change gears and talk about preparations for the next flight. One important question stands. What exactly is going to be inside the payload bay this time? Well, we used to think the answer to that was pretty simple, but it's actually becoming a more complicated topic to dive into. SpaceX recently removed the Starlink simulator satellites from the speed loader crate, having already placed them inside. But why? There are a few possible explanations, so let's talk about it. The first possibility is that SpaceX found something on either the simulator satellites or the loader box that they wanted to tweak. To make those adjustments, they would need to unload those satellites. It's worth noting that the loader was recently lifted up to Ship 38 in Mega Bay 2, potentially to fully test the loader system with it. It could also be that during the last flight, they discovered some kind of inaccuracy with those simulators, and the plan is now to replace them with a revised version on the next mission. The second option is a little more straightforward. Maybe there won't be a payload at all. It's possible that SpaceX has different priorities for Flight 11, and that they consider the recent test of the deployment mechanism a success. To be honest, this scenario doesn't sound likely, as SpaceX normally likes to test as much as possible whenever they can, but who knows. And then there's the third option, which might be the most exciting. What if they decide to load real Starlink satellites into the box? We know that there are already version 3 Starlink satellites sitting in Starbase. Maybe the company is ready to take that next big step and fly actual hardware using Starship as it was always meant to. If that's the case, it would be a logical progression and honestly, a pretty fitting way to close out the long and bumpy road of Block 2 development. Now, to be clear, we have no idea either way. Regardless, this is shaping up to be a very interesting move and one that is going to be worth keeping an eye on. Over at Pad 1, it looks like SpaceX is also going through the process of inspecting and prepping it ahead of Booster 15-2's static fire campaign. Immediately following a successful test, SpaceX will then need to reconfigure Pad 1 just one more time to accommodate Ship 38 on top of the orbital launch mount for its own static fire campaign. Once complete, they can then remove the adapter and move fully into preparations for Flight 11. Honestly, that feels a lot closer than people might realize. On Friday, Activity ahead of the Flight 11 campaign ramped up significantly. Let's start at the pad, where the booster quick disconnect was purged. This is important because this usually takes place at the tail end of inspections, right before the booster is rolled out, set on the launch mount, and then attached to the BQD, or booster quick disconnect. Meanwhile, two road closures popped up on the website. The first from 5 a.m. to noon on Sunday the 6th, and the second from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Monday the 7th. These closures were tied to testing Booster 15-2. SpaceX is clearly getting ready for its second static fire campaign, and they sure did not waste any time at all. And right on cue, Booster 15-2 rolled out of Mega Bay 1 this past Friday, sitting atop the booster transport stand. Late at night, as SpaceX often does to minimize traffic disruptions, Booster 15-2 rolled down Highway 4 on the way to the launch site. The last flight-ready Block 2 booster is now preparing for what we assume will be its final farewell flight since a catch at this point seems unlikely. To recap its journey so far, Booster 15 originally flew on Starship Flight 8 with Ship 34 and achieved the third successful catch in the program. Since then, it's completed one static fire and two separate cryo tests. The first segments of this booster were spotted all the way back in late 2023, and its first static fire took place earlier in this year, back in February. It then flew in March, which means that if it launches this month, the turnaround time for this booster will be roughly six months. Not too shabby for a prototype booster the size of a fully stacked Falcon 9. And again, it seems like SpaceX wasted absolutely no time. During the road closure windows we mentioned earlier, they activated the tank farm, fueled the vehicle, and then ignited all 33 of Booster 15's Raptor engines. While it cleared the way for booster readiness toward Flight 11, it was kind of nostalgic and maybe a little bit sad as we won't see a super heavy booster static fire here again with this current design of launch mount, thus ending a wild era. SpaceX is steadily moving forward with all of the tests they want to complete before Block 3 rolls out. 
Part of that effort involves work inside the Star Factory, and we got some close-up shots of Booster 18.3, a test tank that will be used to simulate the forces acting on the integrated hot staging ring. So what exactly will they do with it? The most likely scenario is that it will be thoroughly cryotested and then subjected to mechanical pressure, probably using something similar to the can crusher system. During hot staging, that section experiences a lot of force, and it needs to stay structurally sound under those loads. This test tank will allow SpaceX to verify that the new hot staging ring design performs as expected and can handle the stresses it will endure while in flight. If you take a look at Booster 18.1 right now, you can actually see this kind of stress testing in action, or at least in preparation. The vertical lines you see are strapped to the bottom part of the can crusher system, and during the test, they'll literally pull on the booster, putting the testing under structural pressure to simulate the forces it would experience during flight. Meanwhile, at the base, pistons simulate the thrust of the Raptor engines. All in all, it's a pretty sophisticated testing setup that SpaceX built here, and it's safe to assume that Booster 18.3 will go through something very similar. And we won't have to wait much longer to see Booster 18.3 in action. On Friday, SpaceX rolled the booster test tank out to the ring yard, finally giving us a full view of it in all of its glory. The tank is made up of five rings, with the hot staging ring sitting on top. Each of the regular rings is about 2 meters tall, while the hot staging ring comes in close to 4 meters. That means the entire assembly stands roughly 14 meters tall, about as tall as a typical American house. Looking at the tank, we can see multiple openings along its sides. Some of these are for connecting propellant lines, while others might provide access to internal components for stress testing. We've seen a very similar approach with Booster 18.1. And yes, the large openings in the upper half appear to be where grid fins could be mounted. We expect Booster 18 to have three of these, but time will tell whether the actual fins will be installed for testing, or if these slots are just for structural testing. After all, Cutouts like this can affect the overall integrity of the vehicle, so even without the hardware installed, they can serve a very important purpose. If you look inside the grid fin slots, you can even see an alignment pin installed, which will help guide the grid fins in during installation. So even if the fins aren't actually mounted on Booster 18.3, SpaceX has made sure that this test article still uses realistic hardware keeping it as true to flight configuration as possible. Also, check out this picture that Jack captured of the beefy struts that make up the hot staging ring. Considering the scale of this test article, these steel bars are massive on their own, but of course, they need to support the full weight of a ship on top, so their stature makes perfect sense. You can also see in the photo how the top dome of the article is reinforced to withstand the force of ship's six Raptor engines, three vacuum and three sea level. All of the welds have a protective layer where the engine plumes would hit the structure. Even though it's just a test article, it well resembles a piece of engineering art. Let's check in on Ship 39, the first Block 3 starship. Right now, it's surrounded by a pretty dense cage of scaffolding inside of the Star Factory as SpaceX works on integrating the Thermal Protection System, or TPS, on its nose. And when I say Ship 39, I really mean just the nose plus the payload bay barrel section. Elsewhere in the Star Factory, other parts of the vehicle are still in production. That said, it looks like SpaceX is closing those gaps pretty quickly, and by the time this nose section is ready for further stacking in Mega Bay 2, the TPS should be fairly advanced. Of course, engineers are almost certainly applying lessons learned from the recent flight, and I'm also sure that they are thrilled to finally have some data after four flights. But for now, Ship 39 is steadily moving forward. Speaking of stacking, Take a look over at Booster 18, which is currently being prepared inside of Mega Bay 1. It still needs an aft section made it to the bottom of the LOX tank, and the methane tank needs to be fully stacked as well, but it's definitely not too far from reaching its full height. Overall, it's becoming very clear how SpaceX is steadily shifting attention and resources toward Block 3 and beyond. On Friday, we observed hardware being moved from the Star Factory out to the yard, and it looks like what you'd expect a load spreader to look like. Could this be part of a Block 3 load spreader for a new booster design? We'll have to wait and see to be sure. SpaceX really seems to be in a hurry to get Flight 11 off the ground, but of course, there is still plenty left to do. When do you think Flight 11 is going to happen? September? October? Drop your guesses in the comments down below. I'm Max Evans for NSF. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.